Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual seminar series organized by the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. I'm Dan Fries, and I'm gonna be the host for today's seminar. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone uh, to please keep your microphones muted. And also, as you just heard, uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted uh, onto YouTube later. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce to you our uh, speaker for today, Assistant Professor Remy Law from NUS Department of Geography. Dr. Law is a climate change ecologist whose work centers on examining the impacts of climate variability and long-term trends on terrestrial ecosystems. In particular, he is interested in studying the dynamics of the terrestrial carbon cycle and photosynthesis. He uses leaf gas exchange, eddy covariance, sap flow, remote sensing, terrestrial biosphere models to examine the interactions between plants and climate at scales from the leaf to the globe. Dr. Law is also a research affiliate with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So in Dr. Law's talk today, he'll introduce the recent progress in estimating global photosynthesis, as well as the challenges in quantifying photosynthesis and the fate of the land carbon sink in relation to a changing climate. Uh, so we'll have the talk and then we'll have a Q&A segment in the last 20 to 25 minutes of the seminar. So Remy, please take it away. Uh, could you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Uh... Uh, I'm Remy Law, and uh, uh, thanks, Dan, for the very uh, kind introduction. I'm very happy today to have this chance to uh, present my work on global photosynthesis uh, at the CNCS Center. And also, as Dan mentioned, uh, I'm an assistant professor at NUS Geography. I started about three months ago here. So I'm very curious to see how my research on global carbon cycle would help uh, Singapore solve its uh, climate change uh, problem. So, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. So in the past two years, there are many climate reports coming out evaluating uh, this kind of global and regional climate from the UN uh, IPCC report to the fourth national climate uh, assessment of uh, United States and also the annual report for each countries. Uh, all these uh, reports unanimously agree that the human emissions of carbon dioxide is the primary cause for our uh, contemporary global warming. So the longest records uh, of uh, uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration uh, showed that the, our global CO2 concentration has increased by about 30%. So it has increased from uh, 320 uh, parts per million uh, to almost uh, 420 parts per million in uh, 2020. Uh, I, I like to look at this figure because uh, so I was born at a CO2 concentration, which is around 355. So sometimes it's uh, uh, let me feel a dis, uh, kind of uh, disheartened that we are unlikely to go back to this level in my uh, lifetime. And with this kind of increase in your carbon dioxide, we see that the increase in air temperature or the carbon dioxide uh, traps heat into at the atmosphere. So the global air temperature has also increased by about 1.5 uh, Celsius degree since the industrial revolution and it's increased by about one degree uh, since, uh, uh, since the, uh, this uh, uh, 1950s. So, uh, and due to the central role of this carbon dioxide in driving climate change, it is uh, imperative for us to understand where does this carbon come and go. Um, so where does this carb come? Uh, so Earth has more than about uh, 40,000 petagram of carbon uh, that is uh, biologically uh, active. Uh, and most of those carbons is stored in the ocean. Uh, and well, land has some carbon stocks, uh, some up to about 2,000 to 3,000 uh, uh, petagram in vegetation biomass and also in the uh, soil carbon storage. Uh, and of course, we also get uh, atmospheric uh, carbon, uh, which is about 900 paragram far, uh, so far, and is uh, keeping uh, increasing. Uh, and we got some carbon st uh, storage uh, in the fossil fuels, uh, such as oil, gas, and the, the, uh, the coal storage. And uh, uh, where does this carbon go? 
according to the global carbon budget uh, report in uh, 2019, uh, due to this uh, burning of the fossil fuels, we emitted about 9.4 petagram of carbon uh, to the atmosphere. And uh, due to this, uh, that's also another 1.5, uh, 1.6 uh, petagram of carbon uh, emitted to the uh, atmosphere due to land cover change, uh, mostly through the uh, process like deforestation and logging. Uh, but not all this carbon will stay in the uh, air. So uh, among those, uh, land would take up about 3.4 petagram of carbon and the ocean took up about uh, 2.5 petagram of carbon. And the rest of the carbon, that is, uh, that is about five petagram will stay in the atmosphere. Uh, since one petagram of carbon would uh, likely to cause a carbon dioxide concentration to increase by about 0 0.0 ppm. So every year, uh, if we uh, leave five petagram of carbon in the atmosphere, we would see the carbon dioxide concentration to increase by one to two ppm. Uh, the very interesting thing to say is that um, our terrestrial ecosystems uh, are serving as a very powerful carbon sink now and is referred to as a land carbon sink. It's uh, taking up about one third uh, of our total emissions every year. So with this, uh, without this uh, land carbon sink, our car uh, the carbon dioxide concentration increase will be much faster than we see today. Uh, therefore, uh, when we talk about this kind of nature-based uh, climate solutions, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, it's really about maintaining and uh, even enhance the land carbon sink uh, we have. Uh, so uh, uh, how does this relate to photosynthesis? The formation of the land carbon sink is the, uh, the net effect of uh, melting carbon fluxes between the land and the atmosphere. Uh, as we say here that there are many ways that an ecosystem can lose carbon. Uh, for example, through the uh, respiration uh, for metabolism and the drought induced mortality of trees and also uh, wildfires and the outbreak of uh, contagious insects. But the only way and the one way to absorb carbon uh, uh, in the uh, land carbon sink process is photosynthesis. So therefore understanding the uh, photosynthesis rate is critical for us to evaluate the carbon uh, sequestration rate of the uh, terrestrial ecosystems. And in the second place, uh, let me take out the laser point. Uh, in the second place, uh, as we know the magnitude of the global photosynthesis, uh, we know that it's around at the magnitude of about 100 to 180 uh, petagram carbon per year. Uh, however, mean, uh, meanwhile, the land carbon sink is only about uh, two to four petagram per year. So photosynthesis is one order of magnitude larger uh, than the land sink. Uh, that requires to have very low uncertainty in the estimation of global photosynthesis because uh, any slight change in the photosynthesis can cause a substantial change uh, for the land carbon sink. Um, oh, uh, I don't know. My, okay. Uh, uh, again, in ecological studies, uh, sometimes we refer this uh, carbon uptake by photosynthesis as a uh, gross primary productivity. So uh, that tells us the total amount of carbon fixed by photosynthesis. And in this presentation, uh, these two concepts uh, are interchangeable with each other. Uh, and here we see that uh, the, fig, uh, the trend of the land carbon sink in the past uh, 60 years. And uh, we see that the land carbon sink is increasing and it also shows uh, very strong interannual variability. So it changes uh, uh, dramatically from year to year. And that also implies that uh, the global photosynthesis would uh, likely to have a trend and also interannual variability. Uh, uh, so get to know how uh, uh, what factors are influencing the global photosynthesis and how photosynthesis reflected to these uh, factors in a changing climate uh, is a science question that uh, we want to answer. So let's start from the basics. Uh, photosynthesis essentially is a biochemical process 
uh, that happens in the chloroplast of leaves. So we got uh, carbon dioxide molecules and water molecules uh, together. And so with the facilitation of nutrient and the light, uh, leaf can produce uh, glucose, uh, oxygen, and water. Uh, so, uh, and glucose is where that we uh, fix the carbon. Uh, just reading from this equation, we know there are uh, several uh, types of constraints that could influence photosynthesis. Uh, first, we get uh, physical constraints. Uh, that include uh, carbon, dioxide, uh, <coughs> carbon dioxide molecules, because carbon dioxide provide the uh, substrate for photosynthesis. And we also need to know the uh, light, because light provides energy to drive the biochemical process. Uh, temperature is also important, because a uh, suitable temperature will, will influence the, uh, the activity of uh, protein and enzyme for photosynthesis. Uh, and the availability of water uh, would also control the uh, carbon uptake rate. Uh, other than this kind of physical constraint, we also get biochemical constraint, uh, uh, mostly uh, related to you know, nutrient conditions, including uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and also the status of the leaves, uh, like a, uh, leaf ages. And uh, all this, uh, these factors uh, decided the maximum for the synthetic capacity of the leaves. Uh, in the absence of physical constraint. Uh, in the third place, uh, we, uh, we were also interested in the uh, changes in the physical environment. And uh, it's, uh, the changes in the physical environment were also likely to uh, cause the, the adjustment of plants for nutrient use. And uh, this process is uh, mostly indicated as uh, acclimation. Uh, the response of biochemical constraint to physical constraint uh, is perhaps a uh, more important process uh, because uh, when we want to predict the uh, photosynthesis on the future climate, uh, we have to consider how plants adjusted to this uh, uh, physical constraint. So in this presentation, I will quickly uh, go through all this constraint on photosynthesis but we'll focus on uh, nitrogen use and uh, the light acclimation, uh, which I indicated here in uh, red. So uh, let's first uh, uh, take a look at the physical constraint. Uh, first, CO2. So uh, from both controlled experiment at a leaf scale and cannabis scale, and uh, also the modeling result, it has been confirmed that that's the increasing uh, carbon dioxide uh, will enhance photosynthesis. And this process is called uh, carbon dioxide fertilization effect. Uh, this process is likely responsible for the increasing uh, carbon sink uh, we saw in the past decades. Uh, however, the magnitude of this carbon dioxide fertilization effect uh, is really a topic under debate. As, uh, and uh, many scientists have used new methods uh, like uh, emergent constraint and the carbon sulfate to uh, study to try to quantify uh, this degree of carbon dioxide fertilization effect and the, also the hot spots of this effect globally. Uh, even a recent study uh, using remote sensing data has claimed that the effect has become weaker. Uh, but I think uh, there are many people who uh, uh, disagree with this conclusion. So uh, uh, there will be some comments on this. Uh, I think it will be in science soon. And the carbon dioxide effect uh, will, cons uh, will consequently induce some uh, positive and negative uh, mm -hmm. feedbacks on the carbon cycle. Uh, in particular, it will induce the effects uh, such as uh, increased water use efficiency, and therefore the water will be, uh, the plants will be more effective in using water for photosynthesis, and the result into a water saving effect. And because of the uh, stronger photosynthesis. Uh, we would also notice that an increase in the foliage amount for most ecosystems. So that's another uh, indirect uh, uh, effect that could uh, cause the photosynthesis, the canopy level photosynthesis to change uh, in the future. So all these feedbacks can also uh, vary across ecosystems, uh, which is um, uh, a very active field of research. Uh, so uh, to sum up, uh, carbon dioxide fertilization effect is known to enhance photosyn uh, global photosynthesis, and uh, it's likely one of the major causes uh, for the positive trend of land carbon sink that we saw. 
um, but the magnitude, uh, spatial pattern, and the indirect effect and trend, uh, I think all these topics are, are on the debate. Okay, uh, then we got to see the physical constraint from climate uh, uh, indicated by temperature and water. So climate impacts on photosynthesis at global scale is uh, uh, very related to the interannual variability of uh, carbon dioxide at growth rate. So many studies have well, confirmed so far that the interannual variability in, uh, uh, in climate drives the interannual variability in carbon cycle. Uh, so these two studies suggest that the tropical temperature controls the interannual variability. Uh, however, uh, there are also some studies recently suggest that um, the dominant factor at the global scale is uh, actually the water availability, uh, not the temperature. Uh, so, uh, and the evidence have shown that both of the temperature and the water have shown uh, quite high expanditory uh, power for the interannual variability of the carbon cycle. Uh, uh, in addition, we also say that ecosystem may show different sensitivity to climate. And uh, for example, the semi-arid ecosystem uh, seem to uh, contribute more variability than uh, the tropical rainforest. And uh, uh, the global climate variability is also very largely associated with the uh, El Nino uh, Southern Os uh, Oscillation process. And during the El Nino years, the Eastern Pacific is likely to have a, a higher precipitation. Therefore, there will be uh, less precipitation in other uh, equatorial regions. So the hotter and the drier conditions will not favor uh, those vegetation photosynthesis uh, for uh, those places. Uh, here I show one of our studies uh, where we use uh, multiple remote sensing based photosynthesis models uh, which indicated by these different colors uh, to study the effect of El Nino on photosynthesis. So there was a, a very strong El Nino events in uh, 2015 uh, and 2016. And we say that all the models uh, show here uh, during El Nino, uh, there's a, a quite clear uh, reduction in the global photosynthesis. And that is mostly driven by the reduction of photosynthesis in Africa and the Eastern Amazon. And meanwhile, if we take a compare that uh, with the result in Nanina year, which is uh, relatively uh, wet, and we see the global photosynthesis will be uh, have a, a positive anomaly uh, during that year. So, uh, uh, so that gives us uh, to the conclusion that uh, currently we think that the climate can influence the interannual variability of global carbon cycle and photosynthesis, um, but. Uh, we say that a large uncertainty in the change spatial pattern of the dominant factors and also the interactions of different climate uh, sensitivities. Uh, then uh, we get to see the influence of light. So compared to uh, temperature and water, the incoming solar radiation for photosynthesis does not show a very strong year-to-year -year variability because uh, the light uh, availability is mostly dependent on the um, changes of the uh, regular solar zenith angle and also the distance between sun and earth. Uh, but there are special cases that with uh, the human emissions of aerosols and even after the eruption of volcanoes, uh, we see that the increase in aerosol in the atmosphere. So uh, with this kind of uh, uh, aerosol loading, uh, we say uh, direct sunlight can be scattered and become uh, diffused sunlight. Uh, which uh, is a, a showed in this uh, first two studies. And the diffuse sunlight, because it's coming in from every direction, it's easier for vegetation to use. So it can improve the uh, photosynthesis uh, efficiency. And uh, the third study shows that uh, light, even though it uh, does not change from year to year, it can also in combination with other climate factors uh, like temperature to also limit photosynthesis. And even within a canopy uh, here, uh, that the distribution of light is also an important factor in controlling uh, ecosystem photosynthesis. And the people are realizing that uh, within a canopy, the sunlit and shaded leaves would have a different uh, photosynthetic capacity. So uh, this is uh, uh, one example that we got from Harvard Forest. As you can see that uh, during the day with the movement of the sun, uh, the distribution of the radiation would changes uh, 
rapidly across a day. And uh, in order to consider this change, uh, uh, we tested multiple models at uh, uh, several uh, sites in Canada. And we've, uh, we tested several models and we found that the models uh, consider sunlit and shaded leaves uh, separately uh, tend to perform better and give us a more realistic estimation of uh, canopy photosynthesis. So uh, all these studies tell us that the direction and distribution of light would also influence the ecosystem uh, photosynthesis. Uh, however, uh, that influence uh, would have uh, less uncertainty uh, so far than the influence from uh, carbon dioxide and uh, uh, climate variability. Okay, so that's about physical constraint. Uh, I have to say that the introduction I gave here uh, is by no means a comprehensive review because uh, there are many regional uh, uh, scale studies and also some indirect impacts like the temperature influence on uh, phenology uh, are not discussed here, but they are also very important to the uh, simulation of photosynthesis. Uh, in the next place, uh, we will move on to uh, take a look at uh, the biochemical constraint on photosynthesis, uh, in particularly uh, nitrogen. So uh, why nitrogen is important? Uh, it's uh, because in the dark reaction of photosynthesis, there's an enzyme called uh, rubulose uh, one five uh, um, uh, bisphosphate carboxylase and oxygenase. It's a, it's a very tricky word. And in short, it's called Rubisco. Uh, it's a K uh, photosynthetic enzyme. It uh, catalyzes the rate of carboxylation in Kelvin Benson cycle and is often regarded as the major limiting factor in photosynthesis reaction. Uh, this K enzyme is very rich in nitrogen. Uh, so in plants uh, from 5% to 40% of the leaf nitrogen are actually used to uh, produce this uh, Rubisco. And uh, it is also the most abundant protein in the world uh, because every plant would need uh, Rubisco uh, to facilitate photosynthesis. Uh, therefore, uh, to study the uh, Rubisco amount is not only important for uh, carbon cycle, but also have implication for a nitrogen cycle. And in order to describe the activity of Rubisco, uh, the parameter that we often use uh, uh, some chemical kinetic metrics like the maximum carboxylation rate uh, and VC max, and also the maximum photosynthetic capacity A max. So they all are uh, directly related to the amount of active Rubisco molecules uh, in leaves. And uh, uh, also uh, there are uh, studies have uh, proved that uh, there is a strong coupling between all this uh, VC max and A max values and the leaf nitrogen content uh, for uh, different species. Uh, therefore, uh, in order to consider this kind of the uh, nitrogen constraint on photosynthesis, uh, it's mostly reflected in the uh, activity of Rubisco. Uh, the question is that uh, Rubisco is a molecule that we cannot see. And so uh, for global simulation, uh, how can we consider this kind of biochemical constraint uh, for photosynthesis? Uh, the most popular uh, method we used is uh, really called plant functional type specific parameterization. So uh, people divide the global vegetation into several groups. Uh, which are referred to as plant functional types based on their climate phenotype, life history, and the spectral characteristics. Uh, so here's a figure uh, shows the plant functional types provided by the MODIS satellite. Uh, you see that the global vegetation is divided into evergreen forest, deci uh, deciduous forest, and uh, shrubland, and all many other plant functional types. And here's another example uh, showing that uh, plant functional types used in uh, land surface models. Uh, in this case, it's uh, community land surface models. We say that other than all these uh, different leaf type and phenotype, they also consider the uh, include this climate information to classify uh, plant functional types. And for each plant functional types, the models then take a very big leap to assume that 
uh, all these plant functional types has very similar biochemical constraint. So uh, this is a review conducted by uh, Alistair Rogers uh, a while back. And uh, all these different symbols indicate a different uh, model and uh, the x-axis indicates different plant functional types. And the y-axis gives you the VC max value. So you see for every model for each plant functional types, uh, they just assign one, uh, one con continuous values uh, to each plant functional type. Uh, so uh, it is very convenient method, but we know it is a compromise. And uh, this uh, kind of me uh, method has been regarded as a, one of the major source of uncertainties for uh, photosynthesis estimation uh, at large scales. Uh, on the right, we show another example of the biochemical constraint, uh, which is indicated uh, the fraction of nitrogen invested in viscose. Uh, we know both are important. Uh, this uh, both of these are important for uh, photosynthesis. Uh, so, a fraction. You know, this is also a key value that we need to know uh, for simulating uh, large scale photosynthesis. And we see here. Uh, similarly to VC max, uh, that different models just assign um, one value uh, to one uh, of a fraction uh, of leaf of leaf nitrogen investment in Rubisco for different plant functional types. Uh, so uh, using this plant functional specific method, the spatial distribution and temporal distribution are largely ignored uh, for global uh, carbon flux simulation. And in order to solve this problem in recent years, we're trying to use uh, remote sensing and the big data and to uh, create a continuous map uh, to solve this problem. First is this uh, remote sensing of leaf chlorophyll content. Uh, leaf chlorophyll content is a, a, a very important pigment for our photosynthesis. And it also contains information on leaf nitrogen um, content. And most importantly, uh, unlike Rubisco and uh, nitrogen, uh, chlorophyll has this kind of very sp uh, special uh, uh, spectral characteristics in the visible band. So uh, we can detect its variation uh, using just a remote sensing data. Uh, but first we have to confirm that uh, this kind of hypothesis um, uh, is, uh, is valid. So we did this uh, through uh, four years of very intensive field work and to collect data. The field work is conducted at one site uh, in a boreal forest in Canada. Uh, so we, uh, we have a flux tower there uh, where we have uh, uh, accompanying the carbon flux and uh, uh, climate uh, data measurement. And here's our team measuring the uh, leaf reflectance, measuring this uh, uh, VCMAX of leaves. And here's me uh, happily extracting leaf chlorophyll content <laughs> Uh, from the leaves. And it's always very fascinating to see that all the leaf pigment changes across the season and across the different species. So uh, uh, using the data that we collected, we confirmed uh, that uh, there is a very strong uh, significant correlation between leaf chlorophyll content and VC max. And further, uh, uh, we developed the model uh, to incorporate the leaf chlorophyll content into a carbon cycle model. Uh, meanwhile, we uh, also developed a very advanced algorithm to uh, get the first map of the leaf chlorophyll content uh, over the globe uh, with the signal dynamic. So with this kind of information, we can estimate this uh, biochemical constraint on photosynthesis, not only spatially, but also temporally. Uh, then we use this new data set um, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to put in our models, uh, and uh, here uh, on the left side is a model that we still use the plant functional type specific VCMAX. On the uh, on the right side is a model that we use chlorophyll information, and we tested this uh, model result at 124 sites over the globe where we have photosynthesis observations. We found that with the addition of the uh, chlorophyll, we can substantially improve the estimation of GPP uh, by reducing bias and also improving this uh, kind of spatial and temporal correlation. And then we further uh, apply this model at a global scale and get a 
uh, provide a new global estimates of photosynthesis. So uh, this is uh, uh, the first uh, study that's using remote sensing chlorophyll to get uh, global VC max. And then uh, in one of our recent studies, we move forward to use big data uh, that we collected globally and remote sensing data to get a global map of uh, fraction of uh, leaf nitrogen invested rubisco. Uh, there, have, there have been many hypotheses uh, that adopted in uh, Earth system models to parameter uh, that's uh, this uh, FRNR. Uh, there are, of course, uh, plant function specific value, and some models assume uh, this uh, fraction would change with uh, nutrient level and also uh, adjusted by climate. And um, But none of this uh, hypothesis has really been uh, thoroughly examined over the globe. And because we do not have a good observations of this uh, FRNR. So uh, in this study, we use a global data set in combination with remote sensing and uh, climate data and soil information to provide uh, to produce the first uh, FRNR map. Uh, the machine learning method uh, we used is a random forest because it's, uh, it can provide a very good functional response curve and also can effectively uh, reduce overfitting issues. Uh, by analyzing the importance of factors. So uh, here is our uh, global result. Uh, we simultaneously uh, using random forest to simulate uh, global VC max and the fraction of leaf nitrogen investing in Rubisco. So let's focus on the result uh, on the uh, bottom left panel here. Uh, this result shows that uh, globally, uh, our uh, the plants used about 18% of the leaf nitrogen in Rubisco, and it shows a pretty large gradient. It's varying from 4.8% uh, to almost 60% spatially. And we also found that all these hypotheses that has been proposed and used in Earth system models uh, show quite different uh, performance, and they all uh, have some sort of efficiency. Uh, then uh, using this data set, we can further look into the sensitivities of changes in the fraction uh, to different uh, climate factors and also the biological factors. Uh, so uh, due to the uh, time limits, so I'm going to skip this one. Um, and uh, so this study and the previous study show that we can use in remote sensing and big data to create this kind of a continuous uh, map of K uh, biophysical constraint. Uh, and biochemical constraint uh, for photosynthesis. Uh, at last, we have to, uh, we will introduce the interaction between the physical and biochemical constraint and using uh, light acclimation as an example. The influence of long-term climate change on plants has got more and more attention now. Uh, and uh, let's assume that plants can acclimate uh, and cope with different um, with climate change. So for example, we see some uh, high profile papers showing that acclimation of uh, photosynthesis to temperature, carbon dioxide, and also to elevation. Uh, however, uh, because we do not have much uh, observation on that, the degree of the acclimation are still all big question marks. Uh, and in this study where uh, we aim at solving the questions on the light acclimation, uh, so what is light acclimation? Uh, here we show how uh, photosynthesis responds to light. Uh, generally, we would, uh, we would say that with the increase of the uh, light on the x-axis, we would say uh, increase in photosynthesis. And until photosynthesis uh, becomes saturated at a certain point. Uh, but if at one place, uh, the average light becomes stronger, then we would say that plants adjust its ability to use light so to uh, improve its photosynthesis. And uh, they see a generally higher light response curve. And the increase of value from Amax1 to Amax2 is what we indicated the light acclimation. Uh, some studies have reported that light acclimation phenomena for some species, and this uh, phenomena should have a very great implication for photosynthesis and global carbon cycle. Uh, but at a global scale, well, we really do not have uh, much observations uh, to uh, 
of that. And also we don't know if it is a widespread phenomena for, uh, uh, for uh, natural vegetation. So in this study, we use a global eddy currents measurement to test this theory. Uh, eddy currents techniques is the a major uh, method to measure the ecosystem carbon flux uh, uh, and the carbon sequestration rate. So there are more than 500 active sites globally. Uh, the basic principle of eddy currents sites is that we mount a, a nanometer on top of the tower uh, uh, to measure the wind speed and the infrared gas analyzer to measure the carbon dioxide concentration in the air, uh, in the air parcel. So the covariation, covariance of the uh, wind speed and the carbon dioxide concentration can provide us the information of carbon dioxide in exchange. So it provides very high frequency observations of the carbon fluxes between the ecosystem and the atmosphere. Uh, globally, we have about 26 million half hour records so far. So uh, using this uh, data, we can fit the light response curve to carbon fluxes, um, like we showed uh, in the last slide, and then we can get the A max value uh, for each site. And with this A max value, uh, we will be able to uh, detect the changes of uh, A max to uh, long term light. Uh, so we divided the, our data into many samples in order to con control some confounding effects due to temperature and the foliage amount. And we found that really there's a, a positive correlation between the A max and long term average light uh, that we show here. And the slope here indicates the acclimation rate. So, uh, so uh, we also repeat this kind of process for all the samples that we collected. And we find that in 85% of the samples, we see that a positive acclimation rate. Um, and the, the rate of acclimation rate is comparable to the leaf level measurement that we got from uh, some uh, literature review. So this is uh, provided the first piece of evidence uh, that globally uh, vegetation would also acclimate to long-term changes in light. Okay, uh, we also got to see the slight acclimation rate with the changes across uh, different plant functional types. Uh, like crop plants generally would be uh, more efficient in using light, therefore it has a, a higher light acclimation rate than other plant functional type. Uh, and uh, for most models, we see that they cannot capture this uh, light acclimation rate. They generally underestimate the light acclimation rate compared to the observation. Uh, therefore, at last, we uh, use a uh, newly uh, proposed uh, ecological theory to incorporate this uh, light acclimation process in our carbon cycle model and improve the simulation of photosynthesis as well. Uh, before I uh, end my talk, I want to highlight the role of eddy currents techniques in the carbon cycle study. So this is uh, actually the method that has uh, developed since the early 1990s. And since then, many countries, especially those uh, developed countries, as you can say, the United States, Europe, uh, they have established a network of uh, eddy currents towers to monitor their ecosystem uh, carbon exchange. So it provides the first hand observations on ecosystem carbon sequestration and provides data for model benchmarking and also examine climate sensitivity. Uh, the huge amount of data used for uh, can be also used for machine learning uh, studies. Uh, for example, uh, the current best estimate of global photosynthesis, annular mean photosynthesis is about 123 petagram uh, carbon per year. So that data is, uh, is uh, estimated using machine learning method in combination with all the flux tower data. Uh, and uh, that result was first published in Science in 2010 and then uh, updated recently uh, in uh, a paper in Nature. Uh, so, but we see that these sites are quite underrepresented in the tropics. So that means the carbon flux estimates uh, in the tropics might have some issues and uh, large uncertainties. And it is a pity that Singapore has no site so far for this uh, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, which really limit our effort to uh, evaluate the carbon uptake of the ecosystems in Singapore. Okay, uh, here are the major takeaways from uh, this presentation. Uh, we went through the different uh, influence of physical constraint about and biochemical constraint on photosynthesis. And uh, uh, we also introduced uh, over long term how physical constraint 
uh, with the influence of biochemical constraint and uh, uh, impact photosynthesis. Uh, okay, uh, with this, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Remy, for a, a great and informative talk uh, and some really insightful sharing, really appreciate it. Um, so we'll now be opening the floor for questions and you may submit your questions via pollev.com forward slash CNCS. I think we're gonna put that link in the chat box uh, soon. And you're able to submit uh, your questions via that website and you're also able to upvote other questions that you also find interesting. Um, okay, so we've already got one uh, question, Remy. Uh, El Nino's negative impact on photosynthesis in 2015 is readily inverted in 2016 when El Nino persisted. Does this indicate strong something? <laughs> Stanley, are you able to, there, thank you. <laughs> Does this indicate strong convergence to steady state of photosynthesis upon, upon prolonged perturbation? Uh, um, uh, I haven't thought about that. I think that's a very good question first. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, I think on El Nino studies, we uh, mostly focus on, the, uh, on its influence on the internal variability. Uh, there are some studies, uh, of course, uh, focusing on the long-term uh, influence of El Nino-induced drought and even wildfire on the uh, long-term effect. Uh, as we know that uh, drought might have some legacy effects that could last up to a decade. So uh, whether it is will con uh, converge to a steady state, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure uh, at this stage. Uh, but again, this is also a uh, model both, uh, based uh, study. So uh, it would uh, also have some uncertainties. Uh, and we know that models are not good at uh, simulating this kind of long-term uh, legacy effect induced by drought. So uh, so I, I think this is kind of the open question that is st still need to be answered. But this is a very uh, acute observation, I would say. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's directly pointed to a uh, key uncertainty in photosynthesis studies. Thanks, Remy. Yeah, great question. You obviously have a photosynthesis fan in the audience. Yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, let's take the, uh, there's this next question here, the top one. It is amazing that many physical and biological parameters that control photosynthesis, but are based on your initial slides, let me ask, about the real fraction of carbon removed by photosynthesis that's locked below ground. Uh, unfortunately, carbon assessments uh, may not consider the entire uh, carbon cycle, uh, CO2 cycle. So, okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, that's, uh, that's already, uh, also a very great question. Oh, I see. I'm a big fan of remote things, uh, photosynthesis here. So, uh, yes, so uh, photosynthesis is just, I would say, just the initial step of carbon uh, uptake. And after the carbon is uh, fixed in the photosynthesis, uh, through photosynthesis, it will be allocated to different places, uh, parts of the uh, parts of the vegetation, like the uh, leaves, trunk, and the roots, and also may uh, some of uh, the carbon might exudate to the soil. So, uh, Yes, uh, I would say uh, current uh, current study is not a comprehensive uh, uh, one. If we only focus on photosynthesis, it would not provide a, uh, the whole picture of the carbon that is actually uh, removed. Uh, so that's why uh, other than photosynthesis, the outgoing carbon fluxes and the carbon residence time and turnover rate uh, is also important. And all those factors would also likely be influenced by uh, many uh, physical and biochemical, uh, biological constraint. Uh, so uh, there are uh, some uh, studies that uh, urges people to just uh, move beyond photosynthesis to uh, also focus on the other part of this uh, carbon cycle. Uh, but I guess my point is that uh, since photosynthesis is a, uh, 
uh, it input of the carbon at the uh, initial stage, uh, and it has still has a large uncertainty here. Uh, it would be great if we can reduce this uncertainty, and then we would have a, a, a better, a stronger confidence in the simulation of the consequent uh, carbon processes. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got this top question that's also been upvoted. So thanks for the nice talk. I'm curious that when you incorporated the optimality-based VC max mode to BASP um, with the improved light response, was the GPP estimate also improved? Uh, yes, so uh, sorry, I haven't got time to show my slides. Uh, so we incorporated the uh, 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 optimality theory into the uh, BAPS model, and we do say, uh, at uh, there's an increase at the signal scale. So the signal variation of the GPP is, in, uh, is improved. Um, but we, uh, we also see a slight, uh, slight improvement in the uh, internal variability of GPP, but it's not as strong as that. It's not significant compared to the signal variation. So it looks like uh, a lot of acclimation is mostly uh, controlling this kind of the uh, uh, VCMAX changes at the seasonal scale, uh, as, as far as the data shows. Great, thank you. Um, okay, everyone, just a reminder that the poll EV link is in the chat box if you, uh, if you do have any other questions. Um, okay, let's go for this top one about eddy covariance. Do eddy covariance flux towers manage to differentiate GPP from MPP uh, by estimating photosynthesis and respiration separately? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, currently, so uh, the air current data uh, the is a direct measurement of the net carbon fluxes uh, between the biosphere and atmosphere. Uh, so the direct measurement is just the, uh, I would say the net ecosystem change. Uh, then uh, based on some partitioning method, uh, which is quite a developed uh, method that we can uh, partition uh, the net ecosystem is changed into GPP and the ecosystem respiration. Um, so, um, but how to move from GPP to MPP, I think uh, uh, cu currently uh, the flux data cannot do so. So um, uh, that also requires to separate the uh, autotrophic respiration and heterotrophic respiration uh, uh, from the ecosystem respiration data, uh, I guess uh, I know I know of there uh, there are some studies like looking into uh, using the temporal uh, correlation, uh, drawing some k period of the uh, flux data to uh, try to separate MPP from GPP, but um, that is still work in progress. Sure, thank you. Okay, we've um, we've still got a few minutes for questions. Um, let's take this, uh, the second question, which is uh, a nice broad one for you. Thanks for the great talk. Do you have any insights to share on how to incorporate these findings into Earth system model development? Oh, uh, yes, that's a, uh, that's a great question. So I, I guess this uh, second part of my talk uh, is uh, all really about uh, try to get rid of the plant functional type and try to have the uh, a understanding of the uh, spatially continuous uh, biochemical constraint available uh, to uh, drive the uh, Earth system models. Uh, so, uh, for example, the leaf chlorophyll content map we show uh, is a, is is not only get this kind of the spatial variation; it also get a temporal variation. So we can easily uh, 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 parameterize the photosynthetic capacities. Uh, at a different time and at different locations without a consideration of plant functional types. So I, I guess this is uh, the way that we are uh, moving uh, forward. We will try to do that. The second part is that uh, with this kind of the data-driven uh, method or the remote sensing data, we can uh, actually um, evaluate some ecological theories that has been incorporated into Earth system models. Uh, is in particular those prognostic models. Uh, for example, uh, the study on the uh, 
FRNR, uh, which we examined uh, several key uh, ecological theories and found that they all have some kind of the uh, uh, drawback uh, flaws in simulating the fraction. Uh, and we, in that paper, we also proposed several uh, case solutions to uh, solve this uh, problem and the uh, in order to improve the ecological series uh, in which to uh, can be incorporated to earth system model development. Great, it's, thanks. Thanks very um, So we've already had that. Okay, so the next question, we've already had the top one. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question is, uh, yeah, we've already had that one. If we can uh, I think we have the one clear that one, please, yeah. Um, in addition, we'll do this top one here. In, in addition to the limited number of eddy covariance towers in the tropics, what are the other limitations uh, that should be addressed to improve global estimates? Oh, uh, that one does thinker. Uh, so uh, the representation of eddy covariance uh, tower is, uh, uh, is, is definitely one issue. And on top of my mind, I think uh, there are uh, uh, maybe other issues. So the first is a control experiment uh, that uh, currently we do not the we do not know know so well about the response of photosynthesis to or, or in general the carbon cycle to uh, different uh, uh, climate change factors like increasing CO two, increasing uh, uh, temperature and the and the uh, what uh, on the changes in the water availability. So there are uh, some controlled experiments that have been conducted to uh, try to quantify this kind of the climate sensitivity or changes to carbon dioxide. Uh, but I, I think those experiments are also very limited that uh, uh, do not have a, a good coverage of this uh, global uh, vegetation. So. Uh, this is one thing that perhaps need to improve. Uh, the second thing is the, the measurement of this uh, uh, K parameters. Uh, uh, the one that I mentioned, the VC max. I think uh, even though we we try to collect a large data set which has about eight thousand uh, samples globally, but I think it's it's still far from enough. Uh, that I I just take a leap here today to call it big data. But I don't think it is really big data because uh, uh, with more data, we, we can definitely do a better job of, at constraining the uh, spatial and temporal correlation uh, patterns of these uh, K parameters. So uh, this is something that I'm also looking forward to do in Singapore because uh, uh, for so many tropical trees and vegetations, uh, this, uh, this, the K parameters here are still uh, a big knowledge gap. So we can try to fin uh, fill that uh, knowledge gap uh, using some more field uh, campaigns and uh, measurements. Thanks, Remy. Yeah, lots, lots still to be done and lots of potential PhD projects out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have time for one more question. Um, so we'll, we'll hit this one here. Great talk. Thanks heaps in your introduction. Uh, you have the sea flux to the ocean higher than to the land, but storage is much higher in the ocean. Uh, comments on that? Yeah, I yeah I think that's a that's a very good observation. And uh, so I'm I'm not a, a really an ocean guy, uh, but but for me, as far as I understand, I think the uh, the uh, the the movement of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to ocean is more like a, a diffusion process that controlled by uh, the phys uh, mostly the uh, gradient of the carbon dioxide. Uh, so um, yeah, and, and the ocean because of the, it's, um, the, the substantial volume of water, so it can um, contain a really uh, a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, with more carbon dioxide in the ocean, uh, it also would uh, decrease the pH value of the uh, um, uh, of the water, and that's why we see some uh, important critical issues around the acidification of of ocean. Uh, 
uh, but the simulation of ocean sink is uh, relatively converged across models. Uh, so its uncertainty is uh, uh, less, is smaller than the uncertainty of the land carbon sink. Uh, so that's why I, uh, and we, the, when we take a look at this kind of interannual variability of the global carbon growth, carbon dioxide growth rate, it's mostly uh, uh, due to the variability in land sink rather than to ocean sink. Cool. Thanks very much, Remy. I think that's our last question, and that just takes Good. us nicely to the top of the hour. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for today, and thanks, Remy, a lot. It was uh, for taking the time to share your work. It was a great presentation and, and some great questions and answers, some very specific questions, some very broad questions, so uh, really interesting all round. Um, so everyone, please feel free to reach out to Remy if, we didn't, uh, if you have any other questions um, uh, that we didn't manage to answer. Um, okay, so everyone, we would appreciate if you could fill, fill in the feedback form, which we'll also send to you um, by email. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, Remy. And uh, we hope to see you at the next event. Thanks very much and have a great day and a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.